War has been a constant for as long as we, as a species, can remember. Among the primal instincts, we have self-preservation, which is a behavior that ensures the survival of an organism. Differently from body armor, which provides passive protection, a shield is a piece of personal armor providing defense by means of active blocks. Now, in this video, we shall study the evolution of the shield throughout history. Hello number ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. You see, the word shield is a massive umbrella term, the variety in size, shape and material alone make it incredibly vast, even if we were to focus only on a single country. However, regardless of the fact it might be rather arduous, I'd like to try and cover the most interesting, iconic and peculiar shields used throughout the world. Ambitious, but exciting nonetheless. So, first question, how long were shields used in history? Can we put a series of dates? Well, sort of. Bronze Age usage is well established by both pictorial and material evidence. They were used over an extremely wide area throughout classical antiquity. They were common or very common in the Middle Ages. For example, Scottish targes were in use from the 13th all the way up to the 17th and 18th century, including the Battle of Culloden in 1746. But what's really interesting to say is that shields never really went out of use, as even today shields are still used by military and law enforcement units for anti-terrorist actions, hostage rescue and riot control. Now, this is all impressive, but if you want to see something really bizarre, well, have you ever seen the SWATBOT Robo Police Shield? It's brilliant. Check this out. All right, so what were shields made of? Well, people and warriors throughout history have excogitated a whole variety of possible combinations of materials. And often these materials did not depend only on the availability of said materials, but also on what the shields were designed to do. So the choice of materials was anything but capricious. During the era of the earliest civilizations, shields were made of wood, animal hide, woven reeds and wicker. In classical antiquity and in the Middle Ages, the material of choice would be poplar tree or lime tree, and the reason being that these kinds of wood would be split resistant. Scientific side note. What is a lime tree? Also called linden or basswood when referring to Northern American species, these kinds of tree are all part of the tilia, which is a genus of over 30 different species, native of the temperate Northern Hemisphere. Tilia species are mostly large and deciduous, ranging from 20 to 40 meters in height. Deciduous means falling off at maturity. The word is normally used to refer to shrubs or trees that lose their leaves or foliage seasonally. The lime tree, which has nothing to do with the lime fruit, has perfect flowers having both male and female parts, rendering it hermaphroditic. When we say poplar, we are talking about one of 25 to 35 different species of deciduous flowering plants, all belonging to the genus called Populus, or, to use actual Latin pronunciation, Populus, some of which are the aspen and the cottonwood. This genus has a large genetic diversity, growing from 15 to 50 meters in height. Now, when talking about Viking shields, we have to take into consideration that the shield was a vital element of the battle gear of a Viking or a Norse warrior who was going on a Viking or a Viking. There was even a wide range of laws and regulation dealing with the construction and maintenance of shields. Now, the most common kind of Viking shield would be the centered grip round shield. These shields were commonly made of lindenwood, poplar, fir and alderwood the most common size varying from 30 to 36 inches in diameter. These shields would often be covered in fibrous materials in the front. 
The sagas mention Lindenwood for Viking shield construction, but actual findings mostly from graves and burials reveal the usage of other timbers, mostly fir, alder and poplar. These timbers are light and not particularly dense, therefore not being inclined to split differently from oak, for example. The fibres of these kinds of wood bind around blades, preventing them to cut deeper with ease. Viking shields, because of the centred grip, allow for a whole variety of tactical advantages and active combat uses. It's a very effective shield, which can be rotated when receiving an attack to destabilise the opponent, following up with deadly blows. Definitely an ingenious piece of kit, testimony of the sophistication of Viking warfare. Another kind of shield that I find to be particularly interesting is the Roman scutum, plural scuta. Now, of course, the majority of people can picture the scutum in their mind when we mention Roman scutum, but what a lot of people fail to realize is that the typical and iconic rectangular full body size Roman scutum is only one block in the evolutionary lifespan of the scutum and Roman shields per se. To be specific, the rectangular one is a typical imperial shield used by heavy citizen infantry, but Roman shields have an evolutionary history of their own. Early Roman shields were round in shape, and they were called glipeus. As soon as the Romans abandoned hoplite phalanx formation and started adopting manipules, they switched to the scutum. Early scuta were oblong and convex shields, transitioning to oval, which will remain in use by cavalry units, and in the 1st century BC the scutum will become rectangular. The Roman scutum provided excellent full body protection at the cost of losing maneuverability, but could be used for special war formations and tactics such as the famous Roman testudo. It could weigh around 10 kilograms and it would be made from three sheets of wood glued together and covered with canvas or leather. Roman scuta also had a metal boss and rim, having a thickness of around 5 to 6 millimeters. Originally the scutum was constructed with three layers of thin strips of wood, either birch or oak, for the majority of cases. Often modern reproduction tend to use two layers of Luan plywood. Now plywood was known already by the Romans, but they didn't always make use of plywood. Sometimes they did, other times they didn't. In fact, plywood was already known by the ancient Egyptians. For the cover, although there were special and several options, a thin facing of rawhide is probably the most accurate. But linen was also used. In the 3rd century, although still in use, the rectangular Roman shield is being replaced by the oval shield. A number of oval Roman shields were discovered in Dura, modern-day Syria. They measured between 107 to 118 centimeters in length and between 92 to 97 centimeters in width. Most Dura shields were manufactured with planks of poplar wood, 8 to 12 millimeters thick. Polybius description, mid 2nd century BC, curved layered wood covered with leather and linen, top and bottom rimmed with metal iron boss. Fayum shields, 1st century BC, curved, layered, oval, three layers of birch wood. Doncaster shield, 1st century AD, flat, rectangular, slightly convex top and bottom edges, three layers of oak and elder, covered with hide. Bronze boss, iron handle, 12 pounds. The Anglo-Saxons ruled Britain for a very long time, until the arrival of the Normans in the 11th century. They fought on foot, and used no cavalry. The Anglo-Saxon shield had a circular shape. It was made by multiple wooden planks held together using some form of adhesive material. A layer of leather was used to cover the shield, making it more resistant. Britain was covered in woods and forests, hence several kinds of wood were used, such as the ash, oak, alder, willow and poplar. The shields ranged from one to three feet in diameter, the biggest of which would be used to make shield walls in combat. Thickness ranging from 5 to 13 millimeters. From the 10th to the 13th century, the kite shield was a very popular alternative to the round shield, commonly associated to the Normans. It provided excellent protection for the body and the legs of the user. Utilized by both cavalry and infantry alike, the shield was particularly effective at protecting mounted warriors, as it could protect the whole flank of the rider during combat. Because of this, sometimes some of these shields had a gradual curve to better fit 
the human torso. The first illustration of a kite shield is found in the Gospels of Otto III, thus indicating it was already in use aside from Normandy, they were used in Spain and in the Holy Roman Empire. The Crusades finally introduced kite shields in great numbers. Arabs and Byzantine soldiers were quite impressed by its design, and by the mid of the 12th century, Byzantium had completely suspended the production of round shields. In the late 12th century, the kite shield will be modified with a flat top, which substituted the early rounded teardrop shape. This was a practical innovation, with the purpose of allowing soldiers to hold the shield upright without limiting their field of vision. The Byzantines will continue to use those shields well into the 13th century, although most European armies will have abandoned the kite shield in favour of the famous heater shield. The heater shield is a smaller and more manageable version of the kite shield. It could be used both mounted or on foot. Now, I'd like to underline uh, as a linguist that the word or the name heater is a Victorian term used for classification. Medieval people would not refer to this shield as a heater shield. Now, the reason why medieval soldiers and knights of the late 12th century preferred this kind of shield is because of the great improvement of body armor, particularly leg protection. At this time, legs were properly protected, hence making the long lower bottom part of the kite shield redundant. From the 15th century onward, the heater shield will become a specialized jousting shield. They were made of wood overlaid with leather, but sometimes they could also be made of metal. An interesting piece is the shield of Edward the Black Prince from Canterbury Cathedral, which had additional layers of gesso, canvas and parchment. Important to note, heater shields were often used for heraldic display. The word buckler derives from an old French word which means boss. And if you think about it, it's almost as if you're taking the boss out of a shield and just start using it. It's a very small shield ranging from 15 to 45 centimeters in diameter. It would be gripped with the fist and used in combination with a sword. Both round and rectangular shapes were possible. The shield already existed in early medieval times but became much more popular in the late Middle Ages and it was designed for jewel rather than for war due to the fact that because of its size it would be completely useless against incoming fire and projectiles. Due to its light weight and high maneuverability, the buckler allowed for swift and precise moves in combat, both being used for defense and offense, particularly effective at deflecting blows. An interesting fun fact about Carolingian shields, which were again round, concave shields, is the fact that they show the economical weight of certain parts of the equipment for soldiers of that time. For instance, a shield at that time would cost one-sixth of the price of a helmet. So shields were much more common among poor soldiers who couldn't even afford a helmet. Adaga, Moorish shields. The Moors were an Arab Berber people from North Africa who started conquering Iberian in the 8th century. To give a little bit of historical context, you have to take into consideration that possibly the reason why they chose this specific date to start conquering the Iberian Peninsula is because at the end of the 8th century, the Visigoth Hispanic Kingdom was indeed falling. Now, Moors in medieval Spain used this very specific kind of shield called a daga, which had several possible shapes and several stages of evolution. It was made of reinforced hide, but he was sturdy and light nonetheless. It could be circular, heart-shaped, and then eventually will evolve into the two overlapping oval shapes, sort of unified the positive aspects and advantages of both the circular and heart-shaped versions. It would measure 69 to 80 centimeters along its oval axis. The shield was good at absorbing sheer impact of blunt weapons, but it was also good at sustaining cuts from sharp edges. Aztec military shields were called Yaochimalli or Yaochimalli, and they came in a variety of designs and materials. They could be made of hide, plated palm leaves. The conquistador described a local shield called Otachimalli, made of strong woven cane with heavy double cotton backing. Early accounts described shields made of split bamboo, woven together with cactus fiber and then covered with feathers. Kuachimalli were instead wooden shields, so wood was also used, and often had a feather facing over which was laid beaten copper. Sometimes shields for decoration would be covered with painted hide, gold and silver foil. 
Moving on to African shields, I would like to say that first off, for the as far as the Egyptians are concerned, I have a dedicated video, and I will link a and I will leave a link in the description below. But African shields in general play an important role in tribal weaponry. They represent the tribe's political, religious, and ritual context. They carry a symbolic meaning of prestige. The Maasai people, found mainly in Tanzania and Kenya, are nomadic herdsmen who made use of their herds to produce rawhide, which was a very common material used in the fabrication of shields. These shields were made of tightly stretched cow hides pinned around a flexible wooden frame. These would then be richly decorated with polychrome designs. The tribes in equatorial Africa, such as in Congo, used the skin of crocodiles utilizing their natural armor to produce their shields, simply cutting them and drying them. The Zaire people instead used shields made of wood because of the fact that in their area trees were more abundant. Other populations also used shields made of wicker. Very famous were the craftsmen of northern Cameroon near Nigeria, who made metal shields which had a bell shape. Pavis, or as you actually pronounce it in Italian, pavese. A pavis is a very large stationary shield used mostly by Italian crossbowmen and archers in the Middle Ages, the most famous of which are the Genoese crossbowmen. An interesting point to make, however, an interesting fun fact, is that the city of Genova is in the Italian region called Liguria, but the name pavis or pavese, or palvese sometimes in the medieval sources, comes from the name of the city Pavia, which is also in northern Italy, but in the region called Lombardia. Bardia, which is the same region where Milan is. Uh, in fact, the city of Pavia is 35 kilometers south of Milan. So the shield, although it was commonly used by Genoese crossbowmen, was invented and developed in the Lombardia region. The Pavese has a prominent central ridge and a large and convex shape, carried on the shoulders by a pavesia or pavesia or a groom. The shield would be deployed in the ground with a spike or held in place by a pavisier. Crossbowmen would crouch and hide behind these shields to cover themselves while reloading. These shields were made of wood and covered with gessoed canvas. The front would then be painted with a coat of arms. Now, when talking about shields, of course, one cannot uh, but talk about the Greeks, uh, because, you know, the Greek shield, for example, the Spartan shield and the shields of the Hoplites um, are definitely very, very famous and very popular. Um, now, when we talk about Greek shields, we are talking about the aspis, but I'd like to first say that the word aspis can be used to mean a specific kind of shield, like the Greek shield, but it can also mean shield in general. So when you talk about the Hoplite shield, most of the times you are referring to the Oplon, um, and please notice that although in English when say, speaking English some people might actually end up pronouncing the H and say hoplon but if you're using Greek then the H is mute in that case and it's not pronounced it's pronounced oplon but in Greece there were many other kinds of shields and in this video we will I'll just mention a few so the oplon is a heavy wooden shield and some of and some hoplon would also have a light covering of thin sheet of bronze over the outer face now these shields can be could remain plain or could be decorated and of course the most famous decoration will be the lambda which is the uh, decoration of the of sparta but for example athenians used the little owl whereas thebian used the decoration of the club of heracles or the sphinx they will be one, around one meter in diameter although again size could uh, change and they would weigh around seven kilograms. These the hoplite shields used for phalanx were normally 25 to 38 millimeters thick. These sort of heavy shields were uh, possible is because the shield would be supported on the shoulders partially. They would have a the so-called argiv grip with a handle at the edge of the shield supported by a leather fastening at the center. The only uh, finding is the Bomazo Vatican shield. It's the only surviving example that we can examine to study how these shields uh, were made and functioned. Other possibilities are the Dorian uh, the shields of the Dorians, the shields of the Mycenaeans, the shields of the Pelta people, and there are many others. But what about the Far East? Japanese, Chinese, 
Korean. But I'd like to start by, with, by mentioning the Chinese. In China, shields were used by both infantry and cavalry men. Now, of course, depending on what dynasty we're talking about, the equipment would change, but I do have a, a specifically dedicated video on Chinese dynasties, link in the description below. They were made of wood and reinforced with metal center and rim, rectangular for infantry, circular for cavalry. They were also lacquered and decorated. As far as the Koreans are concerned, again, Koreans also used shields. Now, you do have to keep in mind that in Far Eastern history and warfare, the shield was part of it, including Japan, although many people don't realize that. Japanese also used shields, and I will mention them in a minute. But um, they were never really a predominant part of warfare in, throughout the entirety of uh, history of these countries. The Koreans used shields, deploying infantry equipped with swords, spears and shields. And another interesting usage was the um, heavy wooden shields used by Korean naval warfare as a means of protecting personnel on top of the decks. Now, for the Japanese, we, we are mostly familiar, I would imagine, with the tate, which is a stationary shield, stationary shield, so very similar to the concept of the Italian pavis, um, used by samurai to protect them from range attacks while they were shooting themselves as, please keep in mind, the early samurai were mounted archers. But handheld shields were also used by earlier, before samurai era. And if you'd like to know more about these, I've got two videos dedicated on Japanese usage of shields. You can find, again, links in the description below. Shields never went out of use. Riot shields are still utilized today by law enforcement as means of protection during a dynamic entry situation during riots, terrorist attacks and a whole variety of situations. Riot shields are lightweight, they cover the agent from head to knee and they protect him against thrown projectiles, melee weapons, molotov, etc. There are several variants, some of which are ballistic, meaning that they can resist firearms fire. Handle arrangement can also vary. Most shields are constructed with a clear polycarbonate or multilayer lex and weaves, while others are made of light metals with a view hole integrated. Modern ballistic shields are specifically designed to defend against handgun, long gun and shotgun fire. The best and most capable ballistic shields will be able to stop high velocity center fire rifle calibers. Other materials include bullet protective composites and ceramic ballistic products. All right then, Noble Ones, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. I thank you for your support, your patience, and of course, I thank you for your time and for watching my content. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.